Well, Merry Christmas. Uh, let me pray, and then I'm going to read the Christmas story to us this morning. Heavenly Father, thanks for bringing us all together, and thank you for caring about our lives. Thank you for being involved in our lives, whether we realize that or not, that you're orchestrating everything perfectly um, for ultimate glory back to you. Um, if not now, then one day um, we're going to see that. We pray that you would reveal that to us. Thank you again for Christmas. Thank you for the Christ child as we read this story, Lord. Let the wonder of it, let your, your, your amazing plan and the orchestration of people May it just sink into our hearts and into our lives, and let us go forth here, Lord, with faith and rest in a God who loves us uh, and would do so much for us. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. Well, let's read this um, story here found in the Gospel of Luke, and Luke gives all the details of the Christmas story here to us. Um, Under careful investigation, he tells us in chapter 1, let me read this to you. Um, and we'll, I'll end at verse 20. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. But the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that's going to be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel then a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away, From them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart, And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Quite a story. Um, We see the orchestration of God. Let me ask you a little bit something, you know, Mary says, I love at the end there, Mary takes all these things, she ponders them, she's probably thinking, she's treasuring, but she's pondering, and, you know, Mary sees this big picture, right? So much has happened. She sees this cast of characters, right? She finds herself in some type of a stable with their baby lying in a manger. Shepherds appear. She hears, obviously, from the shepherds. They'd ask, well, what are you guys doing here? Well, let us tell you what happened to us. She knows the journey to Bethlehem. She's had angels appear before and says, you're going to conceive, not from Joseph, but from the Holy Spirit. And Mary is looking at this big picture, and what is she seeing? She's seeing the orchestration of God, and in one sense, she's treasuring God's ability to orchestrate all things in her life, and we would say now, perfectly. But what a bizarre cast of characters and what weird events that God would use, and he could have probably done it in other ways, but it's the what he chose in his perfection to bring glory and have the setting set for the Christ child. Let me ask you this, if you've kind of pondered, maybe you've done a little bit of that anyways, you're pondering 2017 and the orchestration of the events in your life, do you find yourself treasuring them? Would you say that it's been up and to the right? Fantastic, unbroken string of victories. Great cast of characters. Or would it be peaks and valleys? Yeah, there were some highs, there was a lot of lows, and then back up. Or would it just been, Steve, 
You think the Christmas story was strange. (laughs) Let me tell you about the last 17. I don't want 18 to look like that. This is the way, and we probably all, maybe as we get into the next week, we'll be thinking, oh God, please, if 18 could look any different, this is what I would like, you know? Not necessarily for me, but for my husband, please, because he drove me crazy in 17, or my wife drove me crazy in 17, or my in-laws, oh, they're all with you today. Not my in-laws, but all the... (laughs) Whatever, or, you know, and it could be the in-laws who are sitting there with you. Boy, I hope my daughter and my son are not. But whatever that is, I want to say to you again this morning, we're going to look at this from this text. If Christmas reminds us of anything, it does remind us that God orchestrates all his activities from his view. They are perfect, and they're going to be designed always to bring him glory and to fulfill his purposes. Okay, we're going to look at that this morning in this story. So let's look at this, and I've divided it into two parts, and the second part I'm going to give us kind of a brief response what we should do, but let's look at how God orchestrates what, what his role in the activities um, typically are, and what we see this in the story here before, before us this morning. First of all, I want you to note that God's part, and we can be rest assured of this, that God will always guide. God guides us. God, in fact, will guide me, God is, what does that mean when the Bible says God, God is always sovereignly orchestrating his plans, okay? In his heart, a man plans his ways. We looked at this last week, but it's the Lord who ultimately determines steps, okay? So God is orchestrating events in your life. Even some of the tragedies and the things that have happened to you, the Bible says that he actually can cause all things eventually to work together for the good to those that love the Lord. So God can take things that Maybe even he didn't want to see happen. Choices you made that he allowed you to make that he didn't want you to make, but you made them. And that's the good news with God guiding, God orchestrating. God uses all those things still according to a plan, but God's always guiding, okay? We see this in about three different ways here in the beginning of the story here. First of all, I would say God kind of uses sometimes just even things far beyond our ability to influence, God uses sometimes things that are just happening in a national level, at a societal level, and we find change. Has anyone ever had that happen to them? Anyone have change of plans because 2008 and the downturn in the economy happened? Okay. Anyone get laid off from a job that was outside of your control? Do you realize that sometimes God uses all those things, all those orchestrations, you know, to kind of plan our lives? And really, and it's always when you look in the rearview mirror, they realize, oh, it was perfect. At first, it seemed quite an inconvenience, quite difficult, quite a change of plan. We see this with Joseph, right? What happens? God has a decree issued by Caesar Augustus all the way in Rome that affects this man and his child in Jerusalem, but God is fulfilling prophecy that the baby was not going to be born in Nazareth, that it was going to be born in Bethlehem, so God has, his, has something happen in Rome that affects Joseph. And it's like, gosh, my wife's pregnant, and now, we gotta, now I've got to go. At least I've got to go, okay, really. Because the decree was Joseph had to be the one to register of the lineage of David. He had to go to. But this is just happening. Sometimes God uses that in the orchestration of his plans. Just something beyond our control, and we find ourselves having to respond. Sometimes, though, it's within our little scope. What happens here? And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, with Mary, his wife, his betrothed, who was with child. Now, Mary didn't have to go. In fact, you'd be wondering about Mary. You know, she's great with child. In fact, they're going to finally get, they have this arduous journey. Technically, for the census, Mary didn't have to be there, but Mary was there. Why do you think Mary is there? I think God maybe was using a little bit, if you can kind of remember the story about you know, we got this between 14 and 16-year-old girl, and girl, you know, that was a typical age of being married then, who finds herself pregnant outside of marriage, which would have been an amazing stigma. God provided Elizabeth. We know that he, she went and saw Elizabeth. Remember that? And the two babies actually leaped for joy in the womb when they saw, when they, were in the presence of each other. But I think Elizabeth was a little bit of comfort for Mary. I get to go and see Mary. But now she's back in Nazareth. I can imagine maybe one of the reasons that she left with Joseph was maybe some of the gossiping, judgmental, sideways looks at Mary, and Mary's thinking, if you think I'm staying here, you got another thing coming. You're renting a donkey. 
And we're going to take our time, and I am not staying here all by myself. Because the situation is uncomfortable. I don't have the support I need. I'm going with you. And so sometimes God even uses that, right, to orchestrate his plans. That ever happened to you? You ever have, have difficult people? Had to, have you had to make changes because of difficult people in your life that God kind of puts there? God uses that, right? So sometimes things outside of our control, sometimes even within our region. All kinds of means, all kinds of ways to get us where he wants us to be. What? For his glory and goodness. That's what God's trying to do. I can think of two guys here on staff, actually. Both of them the same way. One worked for his dad's company. 2008 came and downturn, affected gas prices, trucking company, business couldn't keep up, lots of things were happening, and wouldn't you know it, I sat down with him, asked him to be our administrator, and didn't know it, but he said, well, isn't that something, because just yesterday, the business closed. And I just look at, well, doesn't God orchestrate all things perfectly according to his glory? Another guy who just came on staff, Brad, here this morning, everyone, if you didn't meet Brad last week, we introduced him formally, he kind of gave our welcome there, and Brad told me that... um, He had finished um, university and wanted to actually be a history teacher, didn't want to go in the ministry, actually had a little bit of bad taste of ministry for some personal things that had happened in his life. Got down to Florida, and the downturn in the economy happened, and suddenly they were laying off teachers, there were no jobs. He had a friend who had just started a church plant and said, well, why don't you come and help me? So we've got to do something. So he finds that, you know, God orchestrated and suddenly he's in ministry and he's been in ministry the last nine years. Okay, what do we know about that, guys? You can be certain of this. God always guides his people, okay? God always guides his people. It's part of his activities for us. He's doing all things perfectly for his glory. Secondly, I want you to note this part of God's activities. Know that God will guide you Know that God will favor you, okay? God's got an orchestration for your life. You can bet he's always moving. Now, let me just say, while he favors, let me say this about the orchestration of God. Sometimes God makes very clear his guidance to us, and I prefer that, right? You ever kind of hear, you just kind of feel in your heart what God wants you to do. Like the answer is clear, it almost says it. It's unmistakable, Maybe it's through two or three people, they confirm it, and you know exactly what to do. You know, God does that with Joseph in order to get him to take Mary as his wife, right? The angel appears and says, I want you to take her. Angel appears to Mary and says, I want you to carry, you know, the Son of God who will be the Savior of the world. But amazing that God decides in this manner as he guides to use things that are happening on a national level, things that are happening on a very personal level, rather than just saying to Joseph, "Um, hey, I want you to go to Bethlehem and have the baby there. Could God have done that? Why doesn't he do that? You know, again, folks, he is trying to get us to respond by faith. He's trying to grow us. He's not going to do everything for us, and that's the whole struggle, and sometimes I even struggle with, like, why can't you make your way clear to me? You know, but just note this, despite clear messages, God still gets the holy family where they need to be, doesn't he? So, you know, this is why, you know, just God will orchestrate everything perfectly in your life. Know and believe in your heart. God will guide. He will get me there somehow, sometimes very clearly. Sometimes I'm not sure, but I have to trust God. God has a way. When he wants you over there, he will get you over there. Okay. Now, He does that because he favors me. If you're his child, you have found grace in Jesus Christ. We call that blessing, okay? Which does what it means. God delights to bless you. We looked at this last week, if you're here with last week, with the genealogy of Jesus, right? What did we say? God makes his choices concerning me based upon his what? Grace, not upon my track record. Because the whole genealogy of Jesus, he's got Rahab the prostitute in there. He's got foreigners. He's got guys of terrible, terrible character. He's got David, who walked with God closely, was part of his heart, and then strayed. 
commits adultery, wanders away from God, has people killed, and God still says, I'm going to bless you. The Messiah is still going to come through your seed. Because why? I make my choices concerning people based upon grace, not upon track record. Aren't you glad for that? Which means God can take anyone's life that seems I've had so much mess happen in most of my life, and God can say, just wait to see how I'm going to use you in the future. Because I delight to do that. God delights to do it. And that's why you see it over and over and over again. And that's why the Bible says he doesn't really use, he uses some, but he doesn't use many from real heritage and lineage and family. And in fact, we all know this, even families that seem perfect and put together, they're not, are they? They're like the Blue Mountains. I remember being a Canadian, you know, getting to drive, oh, we're going to go through the Blue Mountains, and I get up closer to them. They're not blue. They're only blue from a distance. That's what perfect families are, right? They're perfect from a distance. Until you get to know them, then you realize, is every family on earth dysfunctional? The answer is yes. <laughs> We've all got our, yeah, normal is only a setting on the dryer. I didn't make that up, but that's, that's true, right? Everyone's normal until you get to know them, right? That's why most pastors don't let people get too close. It's true. <laughs> I've been an idiot the last 10 years being way too open and vulnerable with you guys, right? That's why a lot of you have, uh, well, anyway, I won't go there, okay. God delights in doing that. God favors. Let's look at the next part of this story. Who does he go to to show his favor? Who does he go to to announce the birth? Who does he go to in order to spread the word? Does he go to the who's who? Does he go to the ruling class? Does he go to the people who are the wheelers and dealers who are people that are going to listen to him? No. You know who he goes to? I'm going to explain this to you here. He goes to shepherds. Shepherds in those days, guys, those were the despised class, okay? They were ceremonially unclean people. They couldn't offer the sacrifices. They couldn't go to the temple often. To the religious of the day, they were unclean people. They were like, didn't show up to church on Sunday, couldn't go, didn't go, felt like an outcast, so they acted like an outcast. Does that make sense? They were known as thieves, when the herds came in around Bethlehem with all the flocks, because they would kind of graze in that area getting ready for the people would lock their doors. You didn't trust shepherds. They were known to take things. They were a despised class. It was the menial job. You usually had hirelings. You didn't even want your family to do it. If your family had to do it, you gave it to the youngest in the family. David was a shepherd. Because it was a dirty job, it was a menial job. You gave it to hirelings. So they weren't the most trustworthy people. In a court of law, this is interesting with the Sanhedrin, shepherds, a shepherd's testimony about anything did not count in a, court of, in a court of law because they were just deemed these are untrustworthy people. Let me put it this way. A shepherd was not something, guys, that, you, they, that was not a guy that you wanted your daughters to marry. Okay? If your daughters are of age and all of us guys whose daughters are getting close to marriage... You're sitting out there right now. You're like, there's a certain profile. You're like, I do not want this type of boy to marry my daughter. Maybe right now your daughter's you know, dating someone, and you're like, oh, please, if there's a God in heaven. <laughs> right? That's how you would felt if she came home with a shepherd boy. And normally she wouldn't. They were despised. They were the outcasts. And yet here God appears because that's what God delights to do. He loves displaying grace to people who are not, who are not desert. And I read one commentary that says, probably though they, these were righteous shepherds because their righteousness, you know, they kind of, they had earned God's favor and appeal. It's like, no, no, no. I don't usually, you know, it's like, I absolutely disagree. Because <laughs> throughout the Bible, God loves to show grace to people who don't deserve it. In fact, grace is unmerited favor, which means it's kindness that isn't deserved. And yet he uses them to bless. Isn't that amazing? Unmerited favor and kindness. Now, in Jesus Christ, Titus 3, 4 says, But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not based on righteous things we had done, but because of his grace and his mercy. And that's why Christian says, listen, religion to us, it's really a relationship. It's an attachment to a person based upon grace and mercy, not on any righteous thing I had done. 
In fact, the Bible says, in order to get righteousness that I don't deserve, I have to actually admit that I'm unrighteous, which is really hard for all of us to do, right? We have to ad- actually admit that I'm bad in order to get goodness. Because it's goodness I don't deserve, it's Jesus' goodness. It's who I'm attached to. It's who I know. It's not based upon my own credentials. That's what grace is. I felt a little bit about this. I had a little bit of a wonder moment over Thanksgiving. Um, Family went with extended family. which We had a great trip to New York City. And um, one of the things that was way off the beaten path that we got to do is, because my brother-in-law is a financial advisor involved with a firm that's on Wall Street, works with a lot of Wall Street firms, he got us actually into the New York Stock Exchange, right, which is a very old institution. It's this, it really, if you're there, it's the center of power, economy, so much history. Here's me on the floor. I got to be on the floor during the closing bell for the New York Stock Exchange. It was like crazy. Now, again, if you remember the movie Trading Places, it's not, they're not doing all kinds of papers and trading like that. Everything's electronic. It's pads. It's, it's um, you know, everything's kind of divided up. Um, there's, there's news teams there. It's really high tech. But still, being on that historic floor, I was just like, I can't believe this. You know, it's like doing, that's the only time I've ever done selfies, right? I'm just doing selfie, selfie. <laughs> MSNBC's behind me, you know, there's two, two characters I see sometimes on TV, I'm doing selfie, it's kind of, I'm looking at her, she's looking at the camera, I'm like, selfie, really annoying her, you know, I'm just like, wow, and it just kind of gripped me, not many people get to do that, in fact, here's another, just to give you a thing, we're on Wall Street where it's in, it's in a really cool courtyard, so to the left there is the federal building, that's, what, that's it was, actually it was torn down in, I think it was um, 19, or they rebuilt this in the 1800s, But George Washington basically took the oath of office there at the Federal Building, and the Bill of Rights was signed there. In 1920, a car bomb went off, killed like 60-something people, I think, right across the street. It really is, I took this from a room they called the Card Room, which I was told by these guys on Wall Street that um, really the who's who of the day, who were the kind of the insider club, you not only had to have a seat on the exchange, you had to kind of be inside. They would play cards. They'd gamble up there during the day's trading. You know, the Rockefellers of the day. So I'm in this historic building, right, which is really kind of center of, I'm just like, and I'm nothing. These are all trade, you know, it's just like, what do you do? I'm a pastor. (laughs) Yeah, I have no business being here, but I'm with him. (laughs) I realize this is all grace. I have access to a place that most people are never going to visit, whatever, not based upon my own credentials or what I do, but based upon someone else. That's what God delights to do. That's what it means to be attached to Jesus Christ. I have access to the Father, not based upon my own credentials. This is the distinct, if you're not a Christian this morning or you're on your way to becoming one, that's the distinctive Christian message. We have access to the God of the universe based upon not our own credentials, because everyone falls short. I don't care how big of a sinner, how little of a sinner, you're, you're, none of us are going to make it based upon a standard like that. We're there on the credentials of another person. God delights and he loves, loves to orchestrate his plans based upon grace taking unworthy people with abysmal track records to somehow trumpet the message. To trumpet the message, okay? Following that, so God delights, delights to give grace. We'll always communicate and orchestrate things and know this. Because he always wants to use me. He wanted to use shepherds. Isn't that amazing? And they did. Let's go and see where this baby is lying. And what did he tell, where did he tell him it was lying? This is how you're to kind of, sh- kind of figure out where the Christ child is. You're going to find it as you go down into the village. You're going to find it wrapped in cloths and lying in a feeding trough. That's where I've decided to put it. Isn't that amazing? Think for a moment there. This is why we've got to kind of go by faith and say God orchestrates everything perfectly and I have to trust him. God knew he had to give a sign. It was going to be born in Bethlehem. Why God chose kind of almost a setting, a feeling of poverty and rejection and loneliness was for a bigger purpose. Can you imagine Mary, even Joseph saying, "Um, God, later he's going to really provide for this couple. They're going to have to fly to Egypt. Not fly, literally, but they're going to have to flee to Egypt. Right? 
and he's going to actually have three, well, a group of people, Magi from the east, visit them and give them gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Two years later, they're renting a house. These men come so they can get to Egypt. I, if I was married, it's like, really? I endured this arduous journey. We get here to Bethlehem, and you can't provide a room for me to have a baby in in private? I have to lay my baby in a feeding trough? But see, God's orchestrating everything purposely, right? And he has these men come, and they're going to obviously go, okay, we won't look in the room's feeding trough. We'll look in every single stable, and we're going to be looking for a baby. And a couple that would have the audacity with all the germs, right, with no squirty pump, you know. <laughs> we'd, us Americans were there, we'd be like, absolutely not. <laughs> Squirt that thing down, you know. Where are the wet wipes? Where's the Clorox wipe? You know, it's like, because God orchestrates everything perfectly. Sorry, Mary. Sorry, Joseph. I do everything, you know. I want to use you. And this is the way I'm delighting to use you. And the shepherds, this is the way I'm delighting to use you. Now, here's the cool thing when God gets ready to use you. It's amazing. Everyone actually believed, you know, people marveled at what the shepherds had to say to them. People whose testimony wasn't allowed in court. But somehow, you see, when God wants to use you, it doesn't matter who you are, what you think you're capable of, with God in it, orchestrating, giving grace and favor. What God will then do through you will amaze you. That people obviously heard what the shepherds had to say, these people that you wouldn't trust, and they, they were kind of like, wow. It got right to their heart. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that good news? When you feel like you're not qualified, like you've lost the testimony, when God wants to use you, he's going to use you. Okay? So God delights to use you. God wants to give grace. And know this, God is always orchestrating the events of your life. Okay? Now, what's our response? What's our part? Three possible responses this morning to this message. One, it may be that you need to respond with faith. You just have to respond with faith. God has orchestrated you may not like it. God has brought things into your life. God has brought people into your life. God has brought situations in your life, and you may not know. He maybe has told you to do something. Maybe he's led you. And when you know what God wants from you? He, he wants faith. He wants a yes. He wants a trust. What is faith? Faith is simply trust. Faith is what we called Mary had. Mary had this quiet faithfulness about her. Remember, you who were highly favored before she had done anything, Mary had this track record, obviously, that God just said, you know, there's something about Mary, Mary's quiet obedience to the everyday mundane things of life. That ultimately, folks, is what faith is. It's just this quiet obedience. It says, yes, I believe, I trust. Maybe your response this morning is faith. Maybe to help you respond in faith, maybe you need to repent of a little bit of unbelief. Maybe you, gotta, maybe you ought to tell God, God this morning, even Christmas Day, maybe it's one of the greatest gifts, you ought to turn in real repentance and says, I want to tell you that I'm sorry for not trusting you, for complaining too much, not thinking that you're big enough, not thinking that you can orchestrate things. I want to, you know, I want to confess my whining, my whatever. Now, can God handle all that? Yes. Does it please God? No, because the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please him. God delights to, when people just say, Okay, God, it doesn't make sense. I don't know why I have to go through this, but I'm sorry for the way I've been acting, for my attitude, and I'm going to put quiet confidence that you're orchestrating all things perfectly in my life. So maybe your response this morning is one of faith. Maybe it's one of action. Maybe it's like the shepherds. Let's, you know, the proper response to faith ultimately is God usually tells us to go and do something, right? Let's go and see what was told to us. Maybe God has been telling you, it's time to do this. It's time to have this conversation. It's time to make this big move. Maybe it's one of action. What have you been putting off? Is there a conversation? Is there a person? But what is the action? Sometimes action is just in the heart. You know what the Bible says? It's with, our, it's with the heart that we believe and the tongue that we confess. Sometimes an action is just an attitude of the heart that God says, will you respond heart-wise finally to me and my lordship in your life. God always wants the heart response, right? Ultimately. God, action, you know, we got to be careful about that. I think always, you know, as James says, faith without works is dead. So show me your faith by ultimately what you do. 
And for, for a lot of us, there's the next good thing in front of us that God wants us to do. We ought to be doing it. Okay? But sometimes it's just, it's, something's got to happen in the heart first. I have to respond. I've got to get my heart in the right place before I can even do something. So maybe it's a heart response. That's the action this morning. Maybe God's calling you to do something in your heart. So it could be an attitude of faith. It could be something that God wants you to do. Thirdly, it could just be you got to get back to grace and you got to rest in it a little bit. What is grace again? Always starts with this viewpoint, which we see, see through the story, even though it's imperfect and it's filled with all kinds of, again, only God could write a script like this for the birth of a king as the savior of the world to use the people he uses in the setting that he uses over the time period that he uses. It's only God. You've got to rest in his script. What does the story tell us? Listen, God is for that family, not against him. Do you believe that God was for Mary and Joseph? Absolutely never against them at one point in the story. Now, you and I can say that, right? Because we've got the big guy, bird's eye view. They had to always respond in faith and in confidence. They had to rest in this grace, right? That God's always going to have this unmerited favor for me. And I'm going to rest in the fact that even in these difficult things of life that I don't understand that don't make any sense why that happened, I've got to believe somehow that God is for me and that God can ultimately take all the broken pieces of my life and orchestrate them for his glory and actually for the benefit of, well, maybe even yourself one day. And God does that. Here's what the Bible says. Let's look at Romans 8, verse 28. <clears throat> And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So in all things. Before this, Paul said, who can separate us from the love of God? Shall hardships, persecutions, trials, shall principalities, angels, things present, things still yet to come? He said, nothing can, which means there's a lot of bad things that happen to people. A lot of bad things that happen to Christians. None of that can separate you from God's unconditional love for you. And then he says, verse 28 here again, verse 28, and then we know that in all things God can work for the good of those who love him, which means God can take all those things and weave them for the good, you see, because he's orchestrating everything. So God's not dismayed, he's not off plan when something unexpected or tragic happens in your life. You know, Christmas is always this reminder of some of the real terrible things that have happened in our life, right, that we feel deeply sometimes within our families. And God's saying, listen, I, weave every, I can weave everything perfectly. If you don't think I'm capable of that, you know, almost like read what I put down in history, the type of God I am. Okay? Then he goes on, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, and that's what I'm saying, what's grace? Grace means God is for you. So Paul emphasizes that here. If God is for us, he's not saying, I wonder if God, he's saying God is for you, then nothing can be against us and then he gives the example of Jesus here. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also then, along with him, graciously give us all things? Do you see what he's saying there? Jesus Christ is just the beginning of goodness and favor. It's not the end of it. Sometimes you think, I got Jesus, I got my sins forgiven, and that's kind of all I get from God. Everything else, I'm such a screw-up, I'm such a mess-up, He's not really going to bless me, but at least I get Jesus, right? We all feel that way sometimes. Well, at least I get forgiveness. No, he's saying, if he, gave him, if he gave you that, that's just the beginning of good things and blessings and favor. How now not with Jesus can he not then give you all things? Now, that takes a lot of faith because the way God orchestrates and plans and the way the world runs, it's not a string of unbroken victories, folks we got to kind of de-Americanize our perception of reality and go, life is just hard. But God we works and he weaves and he plans and he orchestrates and he guides and he uses. Because that's what he does, because that's what Christmas is. And Christmas reminds us. If you think of this cast of story, only a God like this could orchestrate. It's the same God that's orchestrating your life today. And he wants to bless you. And so maybe today you just need to rest in his grace and just say, God, whew, you're for me, not against me. And then he has to go back to see how it all kind of is on. And I'm actually going to believe in that by faith. 
I don't feel that way, but by faith, I'm going to believe you have good things ahead of me, not bad things. And if anything bad does happen in my life, like the story of Mary, somehow you're weaving it all into your plan. I'll get through it by confidence, by quiet confidence and trust in you. Okay? I'll give you an example of this that God kind of hit me in a big way. And um, young guy from, a different, from another country, actually met him here in the lobby, went out to lunch with him um, last week, told me his story. He said he was, um, got here, engineer, got a, had a job, but just despairing of life, the meaning of life, his own purpose in life, um, had never kind of thought at that level. And he said to me, in the middle of my apartment, had a roommate, but his roommate wasn't there. In the middle of his apartment, he dropped to his knees and basically said to God, and many people have done this, <laughs> he just said to God, you gotta, you gotta show up and you gotta show me something. Because I don't understand you know, where my mind is, I just, and God had already kind of slowly been doing certain things to, to get him to this point, he realized, but he just kind of said, God, you got to show up. I got no answers, and I don't know how to think, but I'm kind of despairing right now, okay? He said about a week later, he's in the shower, and the fire alarm in the apartment building goes off, and, um, but he didn't hear it, and suddenly his roommate kind of bursts into the bathroom and says, um, can you hear the fire alarm is going off? Everyone's outside. You have to get out of the apartment now. So he says, like, I had soap in my hair still all over me. I just got out of the shower. I wrapped a towel around me, and I walked out. And I said, you know, I was like, I love the details. So I was like, like no bathrobe, just like <laughs> bare-chested and everything. Oh, yeah, he said, yeah, bare-chested, soapy, you know, whatever. Standing outside, everyone else in my apartment. Start talking. So he starts talking, right? So here he is, you know, he's out there. I said later, the police came, they, they couldn't figure out what went wrong. I couldn't, you know, fire alarm hadn't been, it, it had gone off, there was no problem. But here he is out there with a bunch of guys. And they start talking about working out. And I said, ah, it's because you work out a little bit, you didn't have a shirt on. And so someone said, hey, do you work out? And he said, yeah, yeah, you know, so I figured, ah, I'm brilliant, brilliant, you know, I'm a real detective. And so um, starts talking to a bunch of guys, kind of in his, hadn't met before, and one guy goes, well, I work out at the, G at the gathering place, you know, the, our church's building next door, right, our little outreach center, um, and told him about that, and he thought, oh, I'll go check it out. So he said the next day, he drove here, and as he was driving to the GP, he passed the church, and he thought to himself, you know what, I'm going to go to that church and see if they have any answers for me. He said, before I even took a membership, so I you know, went to the GP, got all the material for the membership. Before I went and filled it all out and heard it in, he came here that Sunday. Heard the first message, which was, Pastor Jason, I think, was preaching, which is about a worldview, about a mindset, about drawing the line, which really helped. He said then he met another pastor on staff, Bill. Then he mentioned guys at the GP, Sean, Brian. He said things started kind of adding up in my mind. I met him. One Sunday, just outside those doors there, heard his story from the other guys because I said, hey, we got this guy. It's been really cool. Been trying to help him. Gave him a Bible, told him to start reading. So I said, hey, I've, I know these guys gave you a Bible. Have you started reading the gospel of, you know, have you started reading yet? He says, no, not yet. And I, he said, I have some questions. At that exact time, as I'm talking to him there, another member of our church, long-term member, walks out who's from the same country of origin he is who I introduced to quickly, right? I'm like, oh, look at this. Said so-and-so. They start talking. He says, this friend of mine says, I'll meet with you because I can help you with your worldview, part of your, he was kind of half Christian, half Hindu. He grew up. I can kind of help you with all that. Mathematical mind. This guy's also an engineer. They spent hours and hours together, okay? Bottom line is this guy finds Jesus in a real living way. Because God knows how to orchestrate fire alarms and towelless shirts and questions about working out and churches next door to whatever and then the right people and then people coming down the stairs at just the right time and bumping in. Here's the thing. So he actually, the company made changes. He lost his engineering job. Visas are tighter. So he, he was so sad, he said, this church has helped me in so much in my journey, in my getting my mind straight about Christianity and Jesus and where he fits into all the equation of things. And he's had to move now. He's in Seattle, 
and who knows, he may have to go back to his own country. But it'll be cool to see what God is going to do through the life of this young man that somehow God in his orchestration brought to this country, got him a job, had him fall into despair, had him meet the right people, and then suddenly, you know, because, you know, you're, you're part of this story, this guy, and I'm just like, well, this is going to be really cool. He's going to be here a long time. We can disciple him. We can kind of, and then it's like, nope, <laughs> he's gone. Here's the bottom line with faith and grace and trust and confidence. We just have to kind of trust that God's going to do something wonderful in the life of this young man. Now, that story is not just for him. That's for every single person in this room. If somehow you don't think that you qualify, you do qualify. And if you don't think you qualify, good. Because you don't qualify and I don't qualify. It's not on qualification, is it? It's all based upon grace. That's the response at Christmas. It's all faith in the grace of God because it's not deserving. For unto you is born this day in the city of David. He's a savior. He's one who will rescue you because people need rescuing. Your track record's not perfect. My track record's not perfect. God orchestrates everything and he delights to do it because he loves going after wrecked, and broken and sinful people to show away. That's Christmas. Now, what will your response be? Because some people look at Christmas and go, I just don't believe. And that could be your response, but I would, I challenge you to open up your heart a little bit by faith today and maybe look at the events of your life and maybe just see, maybe the hand of God is in there more than you think. And he's been just slowly trying to woo and call you. And as the Bible says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone would hear my voice, I've been calling, I've been wooing, you've been pushing, you've been rejecting. And Jesus would say here, Christmas Eve, why he came, I stand at the door and knock. If you'd only open the door, I will come in. And I will have fellowship with you and you with me. And that's what Christianity is. It is ultimately just a relationship with the living God based upon Jesus Christ. It's all about grace. It's all about who you know. So if you're not a Christian this morning, you say, I, don't, I would encourage you to maybe just apply a little faith. If you're a Christian this morning, maybe it's just this silent confidence back to God. Maybe it's a change of heart for the new year to say, you know what? I think God has some good things and I'm going to start living by faith more rather than worry or doubt or anger or bitterness and say, God, maybe you are orchestrating everything perfectly And I'm going to put my confidence that you have good things in store because you're ultimately a God of grace who somehow loves to bless and give favor. Will you believe that this morning? Will you believe this morning that God even wants to bless and give you favor and do that by faith? Your response. Let's pray. Then we're going to sing. Father, thank you for a silent night and a holy night when I think in that that setting that Luke describes upon his investigation where all was calm and all was bright, that a virgin gave birth to the God-man, God with us, Emmanuel. And he came to save us. Why? Because we deserved it? No, because we're undeserving. But you love being involved with undeserving people. Help us to just embrace that grace, rest in it, and then, Lord, respond in a quiet confidence that we have a God who loves us, who's in control, and who orchestrates everything perfectly for his own glory and for our goodness ultimately. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.